So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many faces here at our guided tour around HPC Carpentry. Um, so we, um, so Trevor uh, will introduce himself in the uh, minute and I will do so as well. But before we do that, I would like to give the word to Mike, um, who has agreed to be our kind of conduct um, facilitator. Mike, can you please introduce yourself and your role? Hey, uh, I'm Mike, and aside from being the code of conduct coordinator that said he was going to read a second document and then for completely forgot, uh, I do HPC work at Tennessee Tech University, which is not the University of Tennessee and is not Vanderbilt, and we're about halfway in between them. So, please, I'm hoping, you know, report something if you need to, but I'm, I'm going to be riffing a little bit, you know, in, in, in case something happens. Cool. Thank you. So, um, if you feel that uh, inappropriate language was used uh, or anything else, uh, please report to Mike. And um, yeah, but we don't hope that this will happen. And I encourage everyone. Mike, real quick, to... can you can you add your contact information, Mike, in the Etherpad? So right now, under the Code of Conduct Coordinator, it has your name. But um... there we are. Yep. Thanks. All good enough. Super. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very Trevor, much. Then the spotlight is on you. Can you please introduce yourself, real quick? Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Trevor Keller. I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I should say the U.S. NIST in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, with a few of you. Um, I've been working on HPC machinery since grad school, had a difficult time coming up to speed, and had the impression that all the relevant knowledge was sort of locked inside the DOE research labs where they had the supercomputers and were using them, and it wasn't really percolating outwards. And uh, when I came to NIST, I said to myself, self, People, other people don't have to go through that process, <laughs> and I can, I can, if I can help in some way, um, to ease that onboarding ramp, that would be good. And so the HBC Carpentry uh, presented itself as an excellent way to get involved and and help people do that. So that's why I'm here. I guess in terms of the website, I've been mostly involved in backend development, so helping to maintain the the GitHub pages side while Peter has been implementing a lot of the curriculum material. So speaking of Peter, back over to you. Hello, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm based in Germany, Europe, uh, that is, uh, late at night. Um, so I, I switched roles recently. I was a HPC support developer um, doing performance engineering, GPU stuff, um, and the like. And now I, got, I recently got a chance to switch back to one of my favorites, uh, being um, machine learning and data science. And so I'm now doing AI, whatever that is. Uh, let's just keep it with those two letters, shall we? Um, and not say what they stand for. Um, so I'm super well uh, prepared in the sense that I stitched together a couple of slides because I don't have an overview who of you that is attending actually attended our Carpentry Con at Home session. So the slide deck is uh, linked way at the top of the etherpad and I hope everybody can see it. Um, please let me know if you cannot um, because I will for sure now massage zoom in a way that it will magically um, show you the slides. Just give me a second. The slides okay. do load in my browser, so we have at least one positive. <laughs> That's encouraging. Thank you. Um, OK. So let me get started. Um, so what we basically had in mind that I'll give you a introduction to HPC Carpentry, a bit of history, and then also the current standing. And, um, and then uh, I'll turn over to, to Trevor, um, who can then show you more of the technical details if you are interested to hear them. And in between and after the talks, we'll have a short section about, I don't know, five to 10 minutes, depending on your questions. Um, 
where you can ask what, what is still unclear and, and something to move forward. One disclaimer in the beginning, um, today is mostly meant really as a guided tour and not really something that um, where we'll take decisions or something. Um, this is to, uh, still due for September and I will return to that later. So don't be afraid, today is really just, well, you, I, we hope that we get a feeling of, of the workshops and, and everything. So yeah, so let's get started. Um, cool, so HPC commentary. Um, why are we here? Um, actually, the, the reason is very simple uh, in a sense that um, when I started back in some day that is long gone, um, I saw this for the first time. So this is me logging into the current cluster of, uh, of my institute, which is called Hemera. Uh, but the details don't matter. And I still remember that when I was in, I don't even know what the English or American or Australian equivalent is, somewhere close to my thesis, to my master thesis, um, I had to do this, use this SSH thing and then hit enter. And then I saw some of these messages. And I have to admit that they were, uh, they looked quite frightened because they were overwhelming me with um, information and I had no clue what these three to four lines mean. And I have still have the impression that when I teach courses today, that there are still uh, a lot of people that are afraid of this. Um, and of course, this is not a fear that they're shaking or something, I hope, but this is more something that stays in their heads um, and that I would claim um, hinders them to be creative sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Okay, and for me, ah, it's uh, look, it's cropped up uh, here at the bottom. Um, and for me, this this fear is is really an obstacle for creativity. And if you see this picture here, where the little boy is uh, trying to draw something on the floor, for me, HPC is the chalk. That's what it always has been, and that what it always will be. Uh, in my impression, because quite frankly, and this is also one of the core reasons why um, the carpentries were conceived in the first place, there are bigger questions to solve than how to enter a cluster. It's as simple as this. Um, okay, anyway, so what I did um, four years ago, uh, well, three and a half, um, I sat down and coded up my own lesson um, because I was quite pumped back in the day by the way the carpentries were teaching um, their material. And um, so this is the first commit to my material set, which is called HPC in a day. And uh, some of the content from this uh, lesson has already landed in HPC carpentry. And basically a community of people called Compute Canada did the same thing, but they were simply more. Um, so there were simply more people and they created the HPC dash carpentry team on GitHub and uh, also filled it with more content that I was ever capable of doing. Um, so that's so that's the part for the history. Um, so what then I roundabout taught 14 HPC in a day workshops um, since I conceived this, this material. Um, so topping about 150 people that I roundabout taught. Um, we did four contributions at conferences, mostly in the Carpentries community and ecosystem. And we actually uh, wrote a paper, um, we being Alan O'Cash and myself, for an ISC Birds of a Feather session last year. And, and right now, what my role is, I'm trying to help to build the community and here and there give my feedback or try to stay on board with the content and give my feedback on um, uh, where the content can go and, and what I think, uh, where the content stands. Um, so this is where we are today. And um, so let's, let's have a deeper look in what an HPC carpentry workshop is and, um, and basically um, what it entails. So I'm not so sure for those people that um, actually are here, um, just a quick, uh, a quick poll, if you allow me. Um, oh, what did I do? Um, in the Etherpad, if you dial over, at the way at the bottom, I'll say um, quick poll, who is a carpentry instructor? So just drop your plus one just behind that, if you are a carpentry 
constructor. Okay, perfect. So that I see, oh, let me count the pluses then. Uh. <laughs> so yeah, it's even more. Okay, I see not, do I see nine? I think I do. Okay, let's, let's assume it's nine. So that means that half of the people that are here um, are carpentry instructors. Okay, fine. Um, so a so couple of the bits, okay, maybe 10. There's another color popping in. Um, so, so then I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit more here and there, um, where I think it's appropriate, um, about half of us. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that is very important for any carpentry lesson material, and I apologize for the, for the formatting here, <laughs> I created these slides in a rush, um, uh, is to come up with an idea with a mental model what your learner looks like. So uh, I copy and pasted this here from uh, the HPC Carpentry webpage. Um, um, so let's go through this real quick. Um, so the assumption is that the learner, pro the learner of our um, HPC Carpentry workshops are knowledgeable in their domain. By domain, this means not necessarily computer science, uh, maybe not even computational. That can be biology, this can be engineering, this can be mathematics, this can be physics. This even can be digital humanities. So comparing large corpora books, stuff like this, okay? So their priority is to get their job done, not necessarily to learn about computers, right? And then at the bottom, and this for new instructors, at least that co-teach with me, um, this is sometimes a little bit overwhelming, but you have to make the assumption, and this is very hard, um, that your learner doesn't even know what a large-scale computing facility is. The difference between cloud, HPC, and grid is a mystery, a mystery to them most of the time, uh, or why it can actually help them achieve their goal, namely to get their job done. Um, and um, for example, um, what is listed here, um, they may even think that programs will automatically run faster as soon as they are run on a cluster, if they know what a cluster is. And this can be stretched further, and I'm going to the learner profiles number two. Um, on top of uh, this, they have only been exposed to using their own laptop or a workstation that is uh, provided to them for the job. They're not really familiar with many of the terms um, or concepts that we use in HPC. So I, I still remember in my one of the first HPC in a day workshops, what I did, I brought over a desktop computer and opened it up and tried to show people with my finger uh, what the individual components were. I believe in hindsight that didn't really help the learning experience, but back in the day I was very idealistic and I thought that this was help. But anyway, um, so just to, to frame this a little bit. Um, and only a scarce ratio of your learners may have some command line background or experience uh, with a programming language, but that is not a, a given. So most of these people um, tend to have used um, graphical user interface in the past and only that. So, so this, is, this is the onset. This is the, the starting point where we leave off with our material. So it's a very rough environment as a teacher um, because on top you get all the other things that you typically get as a teacher. You get um, the typical 20, 20, 60 distribution. So people that show up for your course, 60% of them, the course will be perfect for them. 20% will be bored and 20% will be roughly overwhelmed and, and will be close to giving up almost every five minutes. Um, so this is a rule of thumb in the carpentries, um, how you can typically um, distinguish or differentiate your, your, your learners. So what is super important um, uh, in this business is communication. 
and that is a virtue and a challenge. Um, so for example, if you just think just before the day or the weeks that you will put up the course, in the time before that, um, communication is key. You have to communicate on a website or potentially only in an email that goes around your department or your institute, um, what you will teach. And you can be sure that there will be a lot of people that don't understand what you mean. And this is normal, right? This is the typical challenge that you need to check really closely um, what you write and how you write it and that people will misunderstand it and that's completely okay. Um, so coming to a feature of many uh, carpentry workshops, um, something for example, which we, uh, what we do not have yet uh, in HPC carpentry is a standardized um, pre-workshop survey. So for those of you who do not know what this is, so typically what we want to know, we want to get to know our learners before they show up in, uh, in the workshop. Um, so with that, we typically have a survey that we hand them out. So in my case, I have my uh, learners um, go through the survey prior to the workshop where they can say, or where I try to ask them questions that reveal to me where they are standing. Do they know what the list in Python is? Do they know what a function is in Python? Do, do they have a concept of automation in a for loop? Something like this, okay? So this is super important. And this is, for example, something that the HPC carpentry community is uh, yet missing, besides many other things that the carpentries already have. Then of course, what we need to embrace and what is always uh, and not only a challenge, but also a contribution for me as a teacher is the diversity of learners. So I'm, I'm always happy that um, uh, for each course, I also learn something and uh, this can be something where I overcome my prejudices um, or my uh, false assumptions that I enter uh, with um, in a course uh, or a learner asks me a question that I don't know the answer to and then I cling to my keyboard and uh, try to do a quick experiment to help the learner at least provide him or her a way um, to explore uh, getting near the, uh, the answer. So what I'm trying to, do, to, to tell you with this is that um, typically in a workshop situation, nobody expects from a teacher that he or she knows everything. And this also goes with HPC. So the HPC carpentry lesson curriculum is right now built on the notion of mixing and matching. We have to um, acknowledge that also in HPC, um, the community has a high degree of diversity. And that is uh, something that for me refers to the uh, types of applications that people are after. So let me open uh, in a new tab here in my browser, um, <clears throat> the link that I posted here um, to a markdown file in the HPC Carpentry uh, website, or that renders on the HPC uh, Carpentry website, that I will go through real quickly. So, um, so first of all, something that cannot be missing in an introduction to HPC is the actual um, lesson content that introduces uh, learners to SSHing onto machine, using the scheduler to send a job, controlling the jobs, monitoring the jobs, potentially even loading software modules. And then of course, and that should not be missing, transferring files to and from the cluster. So this is for, for us, for example, when we teach this, this is the minimal lesson that um, everybody has to go through, right? So this is the, the uh, ominous um, introduction to HPC. As a second step, what uh, the Compute Canada people adopted was a condensed form of the shell on uh, or the shell novice material by the carpentries. Um, um, <clears throat> and and this uh, is a bit of a repetition, so to speak. Um, so again, uh, this uh, received contributions um, in the midterm past, something like end of last year, I think. Um, that again, SSH and SCP is discussed. Um, the basics of using the bash command line are re uh, recalled and taught, and then also editing files with the editor and writing and running shell scripts. So 
But back in the day, the idea and motivation behind this repository was that um, typically on the cluster, you can live before the beginning without, uh, without learning um, uh, find and grab, for example, even though they, they are uh, important and helpful, but they're not essential to get around, right? But it's more essential in this lesson to not only get the basics of automating things with the shell, but also um, diving into this uh, being separate from your com uh, compute hardware so that your compute hardware is not on your desk anymore, but rather in a distant place. Um, so this is this was one of the ideas behind this uh, shell on HPC. That something then comes something that um, was uh, in the beginning adopted from the Python novice material from Carp the Carpentries. This uh, here goes by the heading of analysis pipelines with Python. And um, what Compute Canada um, um, uh, did back then was adopt a Python novice at a given point in time add a small section on um, parallelization with multiprocessing, and then contributing a really excellent piece on automating uh, workflows with SnakeMake. So this is actually, uh, uh, for me at least, and yes, I'm a SnakeMake user, so I'm a little bit biased here, but I think the second half of the ma this material in my eyes is the actual um, hallmark uh, content of this, of this lesson. Um, but that remains in the eye of the beholder. So if you're interested, um, feel free to dial over and, and get a look for yourself. But I enjoyed, so I taught this snake make part already twice and I enjoy it very much um, every time. Um, okay, and the last thing um, for historical reasons and here I'm not gonna comment anyhow on Chapel. I have not used Chapel, but um, so back in the day, Compute Canada conceived this piece here, this module on teaching people parallel programming using the chapel language. And as I, as I don't know chapel that hard, I did a couple of superficial uh, tutorials and that was it. Um, but uh, I cannot make any judgment of the status of this uh, material. So, uh, okay. So let me go, let me go back to my slides then. And of course, um, even um, since the beginning that more and more people got attracted to HPC Compentry, uh, so the community grew larger than uh, Compute Canada um, um, installed it in the beginning. Of course, there were people that um, had lesson proposals and um, these are collected, for example, here in the HPC Carpentry coordination repo um, that I will open real quick. And, and uh, here, for example, um, there's a, a, a suggestion by Andy Turner from EPCC in the UK um, from last year, um, conceiving an HPC parallel lesson um, that I, for example, in this issue already agreed to that content from HPC in a day could be um, adopted for this. Um, or what I alluded to earlier that um, I already hear Propose that HPC Python could be split up into HPC Python and HPC workflows for the reasons that I outlined, outlined earlier, because I think the snake make part, part is just wonderful. We are in an active process because people typically always have uh, great ideas that we want to embrace. And um, there was also recently some discussion um, if we should install something like an incubator um, uh, just for HPC carpentry and tool course. Of course, this needs to be thought through and a, a concrete concept needs to be written down what we want to achieve with such an incubator. But I just want uh, to present this idea to you at this point that people in the community are thinking about that. So something that uh, for sure that uh, we are missing as well is um, long-term and short-term assessment. So this is a screenshot of the 2020 Carpentries assessment report uh, of the long-term assessment report, I'm sorry. And um, uh, here's a, uh, the um, visualization of the uh, net promoter score question 
um, that the, the carpentries typically ask attendants of their workshops. And this is surely something that I would like to aspire to um, with HPC carpentry if we can do that. So, so here, uh, not only would it be wonderful to have similar infrastructure as the carpentries to do these kind of assessments, but also, of course, uh, if we can strive to achieve such a high um, uh, happiness among our uh, learners that they would even recommend our courses to others. Okay, so what's the way forward then? So this was really a brief overview of HPC carpentry. Um, I, I didn't want to um, share all the nitty gritty details of the content um, and I invite you to go through the material and read it. It's uh, written in a similar spirit as the carpentry's material. So everything uh, is in prose text so that uh, it's also, it should render itself um, uh, being a good uh, resource for self-study uh, at your own pace. Uh, and so it's, it's really, um, I can only suggest it to you to go through it. Um, so what's the way forward? So as we have um, announced also at uh, CarpentryCon uh, at home this year, um, what we propose is uh, task force. Um, so my personal view for the task force, and this is something to discuss for the actual uh, um, members, um, is um, to establish community processes uh, inside HPC Carpentry um, to implement the lightweight, transparent, and fair governance structure. And of course, to sharpen and nourish the material that is already there, um, possibly even delivering it at your home institute or in your company or wherever you, you want to um, put this content to good use. The recipe how uh, um, or, uh, that defines the milestones for the task force um, is uh, actually comprised here in this program incubation roadmap by the carpentries. Because what we want to achieve with the task force is that HPC carpentry becomes the fourth program inside the carpentries next to software carpentry, data carpentry, and library carpentry. So that's the overarching goal. What does this mean concretely for you that uh, we ask you to think about? Um, so at this moment, um, I wish to say prior to this, uh, to this virtual event, um, we thought that the task force should have a minimum or maximum size of one to four people. But seeing this large interest here, maybe we can think about these numbers again. What we actually want to install is that uh, we have weekly co-working hours where um, people can dial in through Zoom, uh, pick a, an issue that they would like to work on with someone else, and then go forward and um, try to do their best within in this one hour or maybe even one and a half um, um, to achieve progress for a specific small amount of work that helps the entire community. The lifetime of this task force is limited for this moment. Um, as we want to begin in September, um, I would say three months here, so that we see uh, where we are in, at, by the end of 2020 uh, and can review our progress early 2021 and then also um, go into a um, period of um, review with the executive council of the carpentries uh, and those members of the executive council that we're in contact with um, and then see where we stand. Um, that said, um, the executive council is very interested in uh, our activities and I'm sure that um, one or two or three members of the executive council will drop in um, here and there and, and join our community. So what I want to end with is um, to say thank you for coming. I really appreciate every minute that uh, all of you spend with us here and that you are willing to donate to our project. Um, um, this is a very near to my heart, this project, and that's, that's why I still um, um, try to bring it forward and, and keep donating my time as well. Okay, are there any questions?
just have what about the overall vision for the, the project? Do you intend to have one central version of this or do you intend to have each site customize it for their own system and then have their own sort of forked version almost or separately configured if they've got different schedulers yeah. for instance so um that's a very good question um thank you um i think the answer is uh, no and yes so first no then yes um i think in terms of agility it would be best if each individual lesson moves forward independently for now, right? And that we collect experience um, with the content and refine it. But I agree with you that it would be nice if we have a lockstep progression of uh, each individual um, lesson um, at some point. So that we say, um, I don't know, pick a date. Uh, we try to write a paper and tag everything with version 1.0 right? Something like this. And this is curriculum 1.0. And then we move on from that. Because this is, if I remember correctly, the way that the carpentries went themselves. Um, I think that's, that's just my opinion. Um, so yeah, I think everything else also at the state of the uh, of the layout of each lesson at this point, I think anything else would be too much work in the beginning. Um, yeah. yeah, I think in practice as well, the other um, people who teach at the carpentries, they often fork their own lesson. I mean, they keep a university lesson, but that's separate from you know, the carpentries, really. Yeah. yeah, I've actually done that with Python, and I find every time I'm having to review and compare changes, and it's actually quite a lot of work to maintain it. Yeah, there's an RFC for that ongoing about how we should modularize the workshop lessons better. But anyway, um, so I did have some other questions uh, as well. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Colin. Uh, no, it's I'm done. Ah, okay, right. Um, so I, I had a question about the layout exactly, and I put that in the chat. So. Um, like I'm reasonably certain that they should know bash or at least like, you know, the carpentries bash or soft SWC bash before we do the introduction lesson. And even for snake make, like uh, one of the things which I see when I talk to my juniors or my peers is that they don't understand how um, paths work or where their files get sent or all of that. And so, you know, it's like, so you can teach snake make, but then if they don't know how to get the same Python environment and so on and so forth, Yes. And this is true, especially if they use a lot of Conda, right? I mean, which which does all kinds of path magic for you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what we for sure will at some point converge to is like a standardized is not the right word, but a, a guideline how to um, um, how to structure a boot camp, right? So this is also how the carpentries came about in the beginning. Right, there were all these lessons, and then people said, "Okay, um, if we say we're going to have a a carpentry bootcamp, then this is typically first shell, then Python, then whatever, typically Git, or something like this." Right, and I think uh, the same will hold true for the for HPC carpentry. I would propose um, at this point um, what I typically do. Uh, at this point, I think it's it's mostly about okay, um, let's let's um, share somewhere how people teach this material, what, what, what modules do they put uh, next to each other, right? Um, so we could uh, join all these um, different designs. Um, that's the only thing I could propose at this moment. Um, but for sure, um, the other aspect that you touched upon, if I may, um, is communicating what is expected. And this is, and this is the crucial part. And this is also this challenge that I struggle with. Um, correctly say, telling the learners, okay, I expect you to know this much part of Python and this much part of, of the shell. Otherwise, um, I'm holding up my hands. Um, feel free to come, but it's going to be a rough ride. Um, right? And, and for this, at my center, we offer regular carpentry um, uh, courses in a, in a fixed interval. Um, so, because I did notice that a lot of people, and this was your thread actually, that uh, people want to see different libraries, but that's not really the point of working with the HPC, right? I mean, 
if you want to learn parallel programming, then you do it in your computer science department or you do it somewhere else. You learn how to, that, that's not necessarily linked to how you communicate or interact with HPC clusters, right? Um, so maybe we should, I mean, it's just, I, I know this will probably come up more in September, but I mean, I'm mostly on the, the side of no, we, we shouldn't do that at all. Yeah. It's like we don't do boost in, in or boost Python or an ML framework in HPC Python or SWC Python and so on and so forth because it's not all that relevant. Yes. Um, I mean, if our audience is basically the same as the original software carpentry audience, they just have bigger problems, then, I mean, my caveman version of it would be, you know, if I, if I was on a time constraint, I might kill the Python part and maybe kill the Git part if I could fit the HPC specific stuff just after the bash lesson and just call it a one day thing. If exactly. the timing worked out that way, because I can see, I can't see, I mean, I can see having a reduced number of shell lessons in an HPC specific thing, but you know, I could easier jettison Git and Python for 90% of my population at least. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally agree. Um and I think this will remain center specific or site specific. Um because we so in my case, um I typically from I had this so I worked at the biology institute before where I was the HPC support and now I switched to a physics uh, site. So uh, the change of communities couldn't have been harder. Um but um to my surprise the biologists, they asked for the parallelization stuff. They wanted to learn this, um, of course, on a voluntary basis. And that's always how I conducted the courses. But they were always very curious. Um, whereas the, um, the physicists, um, and I don't have too large of a sample for now, um, the, in the beginning, what I, my experience were that they actually were very happy that somebody just finally explained to them how profiling works. And I was like, what? So because so many people just sit down and code parallel code without, without ever measuring, that was something new to them. And I was like, okay, let's, let's go for it then. So, but I agree that we have to draw a line somewhere. So it's, a, it's an important point and we should keep that on the radar for sure. Uh, the, the other question I had is, are we going to be, um, so it's related to this, are we also going to be, like, how are we going to structure this? Like, clearly there are, um, the schedulers, right? And then, but there are also, like, language-specific lessons. So if you're doing Julia, then you have, like, maybe intrinsic parts of it, or, you know, if you're doing C++ or something else. So are we also going to split off into, like, HPC Python, HPC R, and choose something like that? I would think no. Um, at the beginning, I think we should keep our farm as small as possible mm -hmm. um, so that we can concentrate on, on the low hanging fruit for, for now. And, and if, as I mentioned, this would go in the direction of this um, incubator um, idea. Um, but this is for me more in the future. Um, um, so so let's, let's see how it goes. And, and, and let's stick to what we have so far. And if there is larger demand, for example, for this HPC parallel session, then of course we need volunteers to work on that. Um, wishing is one thing, doing the work and discussing over the content and how it needs to be taught is a different story. Um, this is a lesson I, I had to learn as well. Um, so yeah, so I think having a roadmap is a good idea also putting this uh, um, uh, aspect on the roadmap for sure, but tackling it at this point without having um, a large group of people that is willing to do that, that's a different story. Uh, sorry, I know I have to, way too many questions, but the other thing which I wanted to ask is what about hardware? Because one major problem which I've seen is that people will run it on the InfiniBand and they're not using InfiniBand, they'll run it on Omnip and they're like, what's the difference? So, yeah, I mean, they, they don't want to hear what the difference is, to be fair. Like, they're not interested, but it's extremely useful, especially for the admins, because, you know, you, you want them to run on the right cluster. And then, you know, they're like, why is it slow? Why is it slow? It's slow. You know, the HPC is terrible. But 
yeah, I mean, so that, that's an unpopular lesson, but we, we should probably have that somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, be cautious about this, please. That's the, that's the metaphor I had in the beginning with opening, bringing around the computer and opening it up. Um, so what I always try to tell people also that, that co-teach with me is that I never keep to the script, but the script is the best I have. Um, so what this means is that um, I typically take the script and, um, and, and then divert from it when I see, uh, deem it uh, appropriate because you simply never know what kind of learners you will have. So first order approximation, the question that you just asked will come five minutes after everybody have, has left. That has, that's at least my feeling, right? Um, but again, I cannot speak for your learners. Um, it, it will, you will have to see. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, but something that was always very important to me is not to overwhelm people um, because um, that was actually also um, uh, something that, um, if you heard the name before, uh, Mark Gustail uh, recently uh, mentioned in a blog post. Um, so who do you teach for? Do you teach for the A students that come after five minutes with the question that you asked, Roy? Or do you uh, teach for the other people? Um, and this is an oversimplification of a very complicated issue, but um, just keep that in your mind. Um, so if you want to teach that, who will you teach it for? Um, okay, uh, in the interest of time, I, I propose that we continue. Um, so um, let me stop my share. Uh, how will I go to the next? So, hmm. oh, I'm not sure. So, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks everybody for your questions. Um, <clears throat> If you have more, um, remember that the Etherpad is up. Um, I tried to make some notes on Peter's slides. Uh, well, particularly to try to capture some of the content that Peter went off script on <laughs> that isn't in the slides. Um, but if you have, <laughs> see, there you go. Um, but if you have additional questions, um, feel free to, to either type them out in the Etherpad or in the chat window or uh, file a GitHub issue. Um, you know, there's plenty of, I guess, almost uh, an excess of, of ways to contact us. Um, all right, so uh, unlike Peter, I am unprepared for this in that I did not prepare slides. Uh, so the thing that I had in mind, um, so my colleague Andrew Reed and I went through the exercise of customizing uh, the HPC intro lesson for our site uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, and it occurred to, you know, he probably pointed it out. So it occurred to him and he notified me that this is perhaps not intuitive for people who uh, don't have a whole lot of experience managing or contributing to larger Git projects um, or more complicated ones. So the thing that I uh, wanted to do was sort of um, a live demo going through um, identifying an issue that you feel you can uh, contribute to and fix, um, committing the, making the changes, committing them, and pushing them. So if that sounds interesting, um, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, and if not, uh, sorry, let me know. I guess let us know how else we can, we can help. Um, I had filed a, written a comment in the uh, coordination repository that I'm available to tutor people in using Git, particularly for this um, workflow. Um, so this is perhaps one of the first times you're using, some people are using um, multiple forks of a repository um, and uh, it, it can get a little, a little confusing. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out anytime and I'm, I'm happy to help. I know that a lot of other people in the maintainers list are also uh, experienced Git users. So for those of you in that category, uh, sorry if this is a bit uh, redundant. So at this point, I will share my whole screen. Hope there's nothing too shady. There's not, don't worry. I just rebooted. What could go wrong? Um, so hopefully at this point, you can, you can see my screen. 
browser window. Um, okay, so um, the HPC intro lesson um, is on github.com. Hopefully you're all already familiar with that. Um, when you, uh, um, when you open it, um, well, so the, this, a, a built version of the default website is linked here under uh, hpccarpentry.github.io slash HPC intro. Um, that site is built through GitHub pages. Um, so I have a tab open for pages.github.com if you're interested in reading the documentation for how exactly that works. Uh, basically, GitHub will take a repository that has uh, markdown files and HTML that are structured in such a way that a program called Jekyll can read them and convert them into a website. And when you make changes to the repository, GitHub will read those changes, run Jekyll on the repository, and serve the website at a particular address, um, which is typically your username or organization name dot github dot io slash the repository name. So HPC Carpentry dot github dot io slash HPC intro. Uh, and if you click on that, it'll open this website, um, which has the lesson that hopefully, uh, since we're all maintainers here, uh, you've at least seen um, if not actually taught before, uh, in the interest of full confession, though I've done a fair amount of work on this, I have not actually taught the lesson yet. So I uh, hope to fix that this summer or early fall. Um, so um, <clears throat> if we look in some of these lessons, uh, we have a f some a lot of text and then a fair number of uh, shell callout boxes. Um, <clears throat> And sort of early on uh, in the lesson development, these, so like the name of the cluster, uh, Graham at the University of Waterloo were hard coded. And if you wanted to adopt the lesson, you had to go through and change all of those hard coded things to your own um, values, which meant that once you've forked the repository and customized it for your specific cluster, <laughs> there's very little chance that you're going to actually keep updating it with respect to changes on the HBC Carpentry site because it's just the conflicts would be enormous and it would be a, a, just a, a headache to maintain. As a result, there are a number of stale repositories which are customized to the site as it was a few years ago and have not been updated since, which is totally understandable um, and is not meant to be an indictment of, of any kind. Um, but um, so Peter's HBC in a day site is templated. Um, so he uses variables for these things. Um, and Alan O'Cash, I believe, uh, went through and I might be misattributing. I really need to get better at that. Um, but I went through and um, applied that templating to the HBC intro lesson. And so now if you go back to the, the GitHub HBC intro page, um, this is a Jekyll site. Um, so if you want to learn about Jekyll, which is the program that converts the files into a website, um, it's at jekyllrb.com. So this is the documentation. It's a static website generator. So it takes Markdown or HTML and converts it to a static website. Um, so static does not mean boring. It just means there's no dynamic content being loaded from some third party site. Anyway, um, so in Jekyll, um, the important features are this file uh, underscore config dot YML, where YML is YAML or yet another markdown language. Um, so it's a, a sort of structured text file, um, like an ENI file or some, some other kind of sort of database in a file. Um, and down, down below, it sets some values specific to the Carpentries um, look and feel and CSS documents. Um, but up toward the top, and I apologize, this is probably much too small to see and I'm scrolling kind of quickly through it. But um, up toward the top, you can see um, there's a site specific configuration section um, where this is the um, Compute Canada Gram cluster, which was sort of the, the first of the clusters to get documented. 
Um, so this is uh, the name of the cluster is Gram, and it runs the Slurm scheduler. Um, so um, it's just some details. And so in the specific page that we looked at or that I opened before, we saw that the cluster name was Gram, and that its location was University of Waterloo. And so in principle, if we change those values in here to something else like uh, CTCMS at uh, the National Institute of Centers and Technology, then if we rebuilt the site, um, it would have those values, which um, is a pretty, a pretty cool thing. Um, so this is um, sort of structured in a way that you can keep different uh, pieces of information sort of separate. So we have, um, so the local on your users local machines like their laptop you can have you can set the prompt that they'll see so then on the lesson pages you you can avoid using just like a generic dollar sign and have a slightly more interesting command prompt um, that might be more reflective of what what they see on your cluster you can also set details of the the cluster in the remote section so like the the landing page um, address and name and its host name, um, also a representative uh, node host name, its location, um, what prefix the home directories get stuck in, and a prompt on the remote machine that you have control over. So if you have your PS1 set to a specific value, you can set it here, and it will reflect almost exactly um, what they'll actually see, with the exception of your username. Um, it's pretty hard to template that to reflect what they each individual learner will see, but you can get pretty close. Um, and then we have a section on the scheduler. Um, so at the University of Waterloo Gram cluster, they use Slurm, um, which is SBatch to spawn jobs, um, and you have some flags. Um, looking here, this user flag, um, that doesn't seem to me like a scheduler option. That seems like it really belongs up in the remote. So when I log into the remote, uh, your username is something that I see there in the remote uh, login node. Uh, the scheduler probably doesn't actually care what your username is, except for sending nasty emails when things go horribly wrong or the job finishes. Um, so um, before, the, before we started here, I actually went through and um, filed an issue for um, updating the your username variable. Um, and so at the moment, um, so in here, the template variable for the username is under the scheduler section. This seems like the wrong scope. It's part of the remote, not the scheduler. Um, so I would like to fix that. Um, also, at the moment, your username is hard-coded in a, a lot of episodes, even though we have a variable for it in the config.yaml file. So I would like to address these problems um, and hopefully uh, demonstrate some of the workflow around using the HBC intro. Okay, so I've switched to um, my terminal. Um, if I print my working directory, I'm in my HBC intro repository. Um, I'm on the, so I've set my prompt to show me what Git branch I'm on. So I'm on GH pages. Um, so this assumes that you have already cloned the HPC intro repository to your local machine. Um, so I'm going to show the Git remote. So I have origin set up to track uh, the HPC Carpentry HPC intro repository. Um, I also have a couple of other remotes for users. So TKPHD is my user ID. Reed A is Andrew Reed, my colleagues. Uh, and so I can easily use these remote aliases to track changes and pull branches from, from different users' repositories. Um, so the workflow here is to um, stay level with the origin repository or the upstream repository or the sort of primary HPC Carpentry repository for HPC intro. Uh, then make changes on separate branches using a, a GitHub work, uh, branching workflow um, and then push those changes to my fork of the HPC intro repository, and then file a pull request against the upstream HPC Carpentry repository with the changes so that can be reviewed uh, and hopefully merged by somebody who 
reads it first to make sure that it's not utterly wrong. So the first thing to do, since I haven't, I didn't just clone this repository, um, it's probably out of date with some, uh, some changes that have been made recently. So I'm going to update it. So I'm going to get pull origin gh pages. So origin is the upstream, gh pages is the primary branch, and it is also the branch that I'm currently on. Uh, so I'm going to press return and it shows a whole bunch of changes. Uh, so people have been active. And since most of you are on the maintainers list, you've probably been getting all kinds of email in the past few days. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actively in development mode, which is really nice to see. Um, so now I can run git uh, status, which is pretty important to run um, sort of regularly. Um, so, so I run it almost every other command just to make sure that I'm on uh, the right sort of that I am where I think I am and nothing is uncommitted or I'm not accidentally committing things I don't mean to. So the instant issue with the repository um, is in the config.yaml. So I'm going to um, nano underscore config.yaml. Um, I'm using nano because when we do Carpentry's lessons, that's the recommended text editor because it's easy. Uh, don't send me hate mail for using nano. I, use Emacs regularly instead, but um, so now my key bindings are all messed up. But so the problem was that user is in scheduler, not the remote. Um, so I'm going to cut that line and then put it back under um, the remote. So you uncuts, so that should move it. Uh, so then I'm going to save and exit, then run git status again. Um, and it says we've modified config.yaml. So now um, let's see how this, uh, your username is actually used. So I'm gonna run ls. So in Jekyll, the config.yaml file tells Jekyll what to look for and how to build the site, what options to set, that kind of thing. Um, in here, the uh, lesson material is in episodes. Um, so I can uh, CD into episodes, run LS. Um, and then I can, I'm gonna switch back to Emacs because muscle memory. Um, so I'm going to edit the lesson number 11 about the HBC intro. Um, it's loading the Emacs daemon, that's fun. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of set to a hundred character width, which is large. Um, okay, so things like, so mostly this is plain text, so it's a markdown file with plain text, but these uh, curly brace percentages um, are sort of uh, tell Jekyll when it builds the site to include certain things. So this is how you include a figure as HTML. Um, or I think this is including an SVG file from an HTML, through an HTML file that helps to render it correctly. Um, and then, so I'm going to search for bracket size. Okay, so in this lesson, so I'm searching for two left curly braces, which opens a Jekyll uh, liquid variable, and it's not finding any. So, and if I search for, your username, it's not finding any hits. So I can close this and edit number 12. Um, so now if I search for your username, um, so here we have, so go ahead and, so the text says, go ahead and log into the cluster. And since we are building the default site in this case, it would say Graham at, um, yeah, the, at the University of Waterloo. And then it gives the SSH command using your local prompt that you might see on your laptop or workstation, uh, SSH your username at site.remote.login. So you want to change all instances of, so you, your username is hard-coded here, it's hard-coded here and here. So we wanna change all of those instances to uh, use the, the liquid variable. So I'm going to, I can do that here. Uh, so instead of your username, I can do site.remote.uv. Um, 
user. Um, and I like to space these out or pad them with spaces, but um, it's not a requirement. Um, so anything inside of two curly braces will be interpreted by Jekyll as a variable. And when it builds the site, it will fill in the correct value. So in this case, it's your username. If you prefer something else like dollar sign $user uh, or some other string, if you set that in underscore config.yaml, when Jekyll builds the site, it will propagate that throughout the lesson material and you'll see the right thing. Um, so there's a fair amount of these and I don't feel like doing, well, I want to do find and replace, but uh, not necessarily through um, Emacs um, and not file by file. So I'm going to close this. Um, status, okay. So um, I'm going to look for all the MD files and run uh, grep. Tell me what the file name is your username on those files. So there are actually only three files that we need to worry about. Um, so I'm going to set in place, um, replace your user name with, uh, okay, so if I do a single quote, bash will expand those. So I'm going to do, Two braces site dot remote dot user uh, globally on uh, twelve cluster dot md. Okay, and then I'm going to get diff twelve cluster dot md, and it looks to me like that has done the right substitution. Uh, so I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm going to run that find command again and repeat this on 15 and 17. Okay. okay. Um, so that's changed. Um, so now, um, something I forgot to do because I'm terrible at this is do atomic commits. So I'm going to get add, oh wait, so before I add, um, I'm still on the GitHub pages branch, which is not the best practice. So the first thing, so at this point, I'm ready to make a commit, but I'm on the wrong branch. So before I commit, I'm going to check out a new branch, um, check out dash B. And I'm going to go to the um, browser. So I like to name these after the issue number and then the text of the issue or title of the issue. So this would be issue 200, your username variable. Back to the terminal. So I'm gonna call the branch issue 200, your username variable. When I press return, it tells me that a bunch of files have been modified. Uh, it's creating a new branch and my prompt tells me that I'm on the right branch. So now I'm going to add uh, config.yaml. I'm going to git commit-m um, move user from sked to remote. Okay. And then I'm going to git add and update the rest, run git status. Um, so this has only changed those files, or this has changed all those files, and I can git commit um, place hard coded your names. Okay. Um, the other thing to do is, uh, so user used to be under sketch, now it's under remote. So we have to do the same find and replace uh, to swap between the two. Um, so I'm going to up arrow a bunch to get that find command again. Um, sketch dot user in all the files, okay. Um, and then what if I see the, oh, I see the upper direct, oh, 
I'm already in, lost track of my place. Um, so yeah, in templating the site, um, so we have a default configuration, which is the Gram cluster at the uh, University of Waterloo. If you look in, so looking at the repository, um, the lesson material is described in the episodes folder. And then in includes, uh, we have a snippet library. So for each site that people have generously contributed information to, under includes snippets library, we have um, one, two, three, four, five different clusters um, already prepared. And if you look in one of these, for example, the Compute Canada Gram cluster, um, each lesson that has a site specific uh, input or output that needs to be rendered into the lesson um, has a folder for that lesson with some content in it. Uh, and these are snippets, so we give them the .snip extension. I believe we could give these the MD extension also, um, although that might make Jekyll attempt to render them as separate markdown, and that could get messy. So for the moment, we have them as individual .snip files. I'm going to repeat this find command on the .snip files. Oh, interesting. OK, so sketch dot user was not used in any of those. So OK. Um, so this user thing hasn't really made its way out into the snippets yet. Uh, if it's it, it's possible that it's not really useful there, um, but this is good. It means that we can uh, cd back into episodes and sort of modify the sed command that we used before to search and replace all instances of your username. Um, my okay. I'm going to combine attempt to combine these two commands. Find star dot e sorry so this has turned into a bit of a no no i don't want to do that let's just there were only a couple of files and chaining together said and find is kind of uh, fraught because of the different variable substitution and expansion um but user so i can do And all of the site dot sketch dot user and replace them with site dot remote dot user in cluster number twelve cluster and number sixteen resources. Um, so sorry, did get us. Did we lose braces somewhere in that? Yeah, be careful. Oh yeah, sorry. Yep. Um, okay, so we. I guess we added braces. You added braces. Yeah. Great. Cool. Thanks. Um, so now I need to search for site.remote.user and it's it with just the one in 16 and in 12. Okay, so then git diff. Okay, so now site.sketch.user was replaced with site.remote.user. Site remote user. We have the right number per the basis. Thanks for spot checking my coding. It looks like we only have a couple of changes, so that's fine. Um, so that looks right to me. So I'm going to git add update. If I run git status, type out my alias this time. Okay, so we've modified those things. They're staged for commit. Uh, give it um, usernames. Uh, with oh, uh, location. That's not the most sensible commit name, but uh, it's the one I'm going with. Uh, so now I'm going to run git status again. So our working directory is clean. Uh, I'm on the issue 200 branch, so that looks fine. Um, so I'm going to run git remote dash v just to double check my uh, origin is in fact the HPC carpentry and the my personal fork is this uh, TKPHD HPC intro. So I'm going to git 
push uh, tkphd as the alias, uh, and I'm going to start typing issue 200 and press tab. That's the branch name that I want to push. So when I press Enter on that, uh, it will send out some text. Um, so we have a new branch, and it helpfully suggests I can open this link uh, to open a pull request. So I'm going to copy the link, go back to my browser. Trevor? Yes. Um, so the the underscore config YAML files inside the various uh, snippet things haven't been fixed. Is that right? That is correct. That is a good... OK, so great. A pre-review comment. This might be a first. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so as Andrew, it, sorry. Out, <laughs> as Andrew points out, um, uh, this would have been a breaking change because I forgot to update all those snippet libraries. I'm going to see the, uh, so I'm in the top level directory. I can see the into includes a snippet library um, and then edit the Compute Canada uh, config options. Because I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, find here dash name that dash exec uh, emacs dash w file name. You have to prefix with an underscore in the file name. Yes, I do. Thanks. OK. Um, so then I can go down to the So the Compute Canada thing does not actually have a user field, which means that when we write it, um, well, OK, so we can add it here for them. Um, username. OK. Um, can, sorry, can, Trevor, there's a there's a user under sched.flag.user in that file. Yes, there is. Um, so that is oh, there's so there's one. Um, so I'm going to so that is the user flag in the scheduler. So if you do like uh, s account oh, gosh you username that that templates that output. So that that is actually correct. That's scoped appropriately for the scheduler. Um, you might also notice, so there's a lot of duplicate code for um, your username in these files. And um, so if the, yeah, I forget what, so if this is the, the Norway snippets library, if you're here, uh, you might want to edit your config. So your user is dollar sign user here, but your username and your prompts. So you might want to change these strings to match. I'm not going to mess with that. I'm, the scope of this commit is just to change the uh, hierarchy of the from sketch.user to remote.user, but that's something to think about. Um, errors, that's kind of annoying. Okay, so. Um, Didn't have it. Um, uh, name. Uh, so the Lola thing should be your username. I'm just going to sneak in that edit because I can. Um, shouldn't do that. Uh, so University of Edinburgh people, uh, this Lola. Um, I think that's residual from an older version of the lessons that had a story in them about a person named Lola. Um, perhaps changing that to your username would um, make a better fit with the rest of the lesson. But 
it's up to you. Okay, so I'm gonna so that finished that. Uh, I'm gonna run git status again. Okay, added a bunch of files. I'm gonna cd up a couple of times. Add dash u git commit. Um, user variable in snippet configs. OK, so now um, I can, so since I, I can run and get status a final time on this issue 200 branch, the commit is clean, so I can get push uh, my remote and issue 200. And when I press tab after the 200, it auto completes the branch name. So I'm going to push this to my fork of HPC intro into a new branch on my fork called issue 200 your username variable. Um, sorry, an existing branch because I already did this once. Um, and so now when I go to here and open a pull request on it, um, uh, issue 200, your username variable. So it auto populates the title of the pull request um, with the branch name. Um, move uh, user variable. Your scope. Um, and closes number 200. Um, so this closes keyword lets git and GitHub know, well, and let's GitHub know that this issue number 200 is related to this pull request. Um, so now when I create this pull request, uh, it will start running tests. So it brings me to this pull request um, page. So this is pull request number 202. Um, all of these people just got emails that there's a new pull request uh, and that the review on it has been requested. Um, it will start running checks through the GitHub action. So it'll run a spell check and then it will build the, the lesson using the default configuration and each of the configurations set in the uh, snippet libraries. Uh, so since the new, well, since the old user variable has been rehomed in all of these, so it's set in the top level config.yaml. Um, and then it's also set in the snippet libraries uh, config options.yaml files. And so in Jekyll, the latest or the, you can specify multiple config files on the command line as a comma separated list. And the last um, config file in that list that sets a specific variable uh, overwrites everything before it. So the default, your username will get overwritten in uh, whichever of these have customized that variable to be their local, whichever one they prefer uh, to call the user. Um, so that's a pull request. Um, if so, we can wait five minutes for uh, this to pass testing. Um, and then um, if somebody wants to approve it, we can merge it. Um, I can also, while that is reviewing, I can pause here and take any questions you might have. I don't know if that freaked anybody out, but if it did, check the chat and I've got a I think uh, not nearly as uh, widely scoped uh, thing for people that were just basically hadn't gone through the Git lessons and needed to do a pull request to get out of their uh, uh, instructor checkout. And so for little things, all in GitHub, uh, no extra tools required, but not nearly as involved, but not nearly as involved or as powerful as what you did there. Yeah, so, um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can uh, actually look at the chat because now I'm curious. But um, ooh, there's a lot of messages. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's something that um, Andrew and I, in going through the um, 
through some other changes on the lesson and sort of trying to port the material for our cluster came across as like, okay, there's there's a lot to this. It's pretty involved. So I wanted to sort of demo the workflow here. Um, and if it's an intimidating, uh, sorry, hopefully that, I'm glad that you saw that the power of it. Um, so there's some reason for, <laughs> so it's a powerful tool that takes some getting used to. Um, it's normal to be a little apprehensive of Git. I know I was when I started using it. Um, and I think it was a useful interaction for both Andrew and myself uh, to go through the modification and commit and merge process uh, with so him typing and asking questions as he went and my sort of looking over his shoulder, uh, spot checking, mostly staying quiet and just answering questions um, and offering reassurances as, as necessary. Um, but yeah, so for simpler changes, like if you see an issue, so as you're reading through them, if you see an issue relating to spelling or grammar or something like that, you don't have to use this command line uh, fork driven workflow. You can also, <laughs> lots of reassurances. You can also go directly to the HPC intro GitHub repository web page um, and make an edit directly. So any file that you see, there's an edit button in the top right. You can click that and GitHub will do this um, forking and pull request sort of thing in the background for you. You can edit it in your browser. It's very um, light touch. It handles a lot of this in the background. Uh, and so it's yeah, kind of kind of nice. Um, but if you want to do deeper things or something that can be automated, like replacing everything with too many curly braces, going to the command line is, is sort of a, a more flexible and powerful way to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Um, I see that Peter has, and Andrew have both approved the pull request. Uh, it passed spell check, hasn't actually tested anything, but um, I'm going to cross my fingers and hope <laughs> that um, it will pass. Um, so there are two ways that you can do this. So in the, um, in the browser window, there is this merge pull request button. Um, which I can press and um, have it work. Um, or, you know, since you're all maintainers, I'm not going to do that. If somebody else feels like taking the chance and risking breaking the website uh, by merging my pull request, um, please go ahead and do so. And I promise if it does break, I will fix it in short order. Oh, it looks like so. To reassure you, it did pass a few of the site-specific builds, and these are running in parallel. Um, Alan Ocash recommend, or actually just converted us from using Travis CI, which does these uh, site builds in serial, so one at a time, and it took a half an hour to do. Um, he converted us over to the GitHub Actions, uh, which runs all of them in parallel and finishes pretty quickly. So this tells us that all the checks have passed, which is awesome. And somebody hopefully already merged this. So, oh no, they didn't. So it just, it just says that it passed. I can read, I'm just gonna refresh this. And now if somebody wants to push that shiny green button, um, cool. All right, so this just got uh, merged. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike has been very responsive on reviewing and merging pull requests, which is awesome. Um, so now as the person who filed the pull request, uh, it gives me this message that the pull request was successfully merged and closed. Um, and it says, you're all set. My changes have been merged into the main repository. So the my local branch, so the TKPHD fork, uh, issue 200, et cetera, branch can be safely deleted. So to avoid cluttering my fork of HPC intro, I'm going to press this delete branch button, which will delete it from my, so on GitHub, I have a fork of the HPC intro site, um, and it just deleted the branch that I created. And then there's one last thing to do, which is to go back to my local machine. So, um, so I'm going to uh, take a look. So I have um, three branches so the GH pages branch, this issue 200 branch and a CTCMS pages branch. Uh, so I'm going to check out the GH pages branch. Now I can, since it's been, since the issue 200 branch has been merged, I can do git branch dash D for delete issue 200 and hit tab. This gives an error that the branch is not fully merged, which means, hey, you're on this 
other GH pages branch or the branch that you so I'm on GH pages, which is the branch that I branched off of to create the issue 200 branch. Sorry for using branch about 80 times in that sentence. Uh, I wish there was a better way. Uh, if you see it available, take John Geyer's advanced git. Uh, it'll, it'll fill your head with all kinds of git branching commands. Um, so um, this is not true. So the, the GH pages branch upstream on the HPC Carpentry site has all these changes. Uh, I just need to synchronize. So if I git pull origin gh pages, um, so that pulls all the changes that I just made, and then I can up arrow a couple of times and run that uh, delete command again, and it will delete the branch on my local machine. And um, now when I run git branch, I just have one. Uh, so I have been delinquent and should delete that CTCMS pages branch as well, but that's to be done on a different day. So with that, um, yeah, that is how, so a very quick, well, a relatively quick, <laughs> um, we identified an issue that we could fix. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can, people can see my face. Um, yeah, so. I'm sorry, what was that, Rohit? Uh, your video is off, so we can't see your face. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> so you can see my blank rectangle. Uh, I wish somebody had mentioned that sooner or I had noticed. All right, now you can see my face and I can see some of yours. So that was a very quick demo of uh, identifying an issue that I had confidence that I could fix and going through the command line um, process of um, creating a branch, making the fixes, um, pushing up to my fork of HPC intro and then filing a pull request, having a few people review the pull request and then merging that and cleaning up. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Cool, thanks for that. Are, sure, happy to. Um, yeah, and that concludes the content that we planned. Um, we've been connected now for over 90 minutes. Um, well, I'm open for questions, but I also understand if people are tired. And um, but feel free to shoot out a question if you haven't. So, uh, do we have any idea where we can run this without an HPC present? I mean, in some sense, like because that's something at least I've not had any experience with. I suppose you could configure a Docker image to have Slurm and everything installed. I've just never done it. So uh, do any of you have any experience with that? Like a test environment? Yeah, like so something which people can just install on their laptop and just mess around with. Dory just left. Uh, she was running a workshop at the first of Perk this last week uh, that would have been in Portland. Mm -hmm. And they have, as part of their workshop, give me a minute to look it up, um, if you've got two spare Raspberry Pis, I've got a script for making a Slurm cluster on a Raspberry Pi. Ooh, nice. uh, they actually did a pretty, between them, Virginia Tech, and Ohio Supercomputer Center, they put together this GitHub repo for the workshop because it was mostly to advertise their uh, management tools. Mm -hmm. But all in Docker, allegedly oh, on yeah. whatever Docker you've got, Here's two slurm nodes, a head node, Excellent. single sign on, uh, everything. Separate database servers. It, I was floored. This is a bit that it worked as well as it did. I'm sure we don't need to spin up a full DB, and they have two DBs. Wow. Okay, Maria DB. They, again, it was. It, it's it's more than you need. Yeah. Uh, there's also not in Docker, but uh, one thing that I'm kind of contributing to that if you're willing to set up a couple of virtual boxes uh, is XCBC, ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. that is basically stand up a head node, or yeah, I mean a management node, and uh, you need a private network segment if you do it in VirtualBox. The main maintainer actually just does his testing in, in VirtualBox. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I, I think we need to we need to formalize this part of the lesson so that everyone because I see there's a lot of confusion. Maybe maybe it was my understanding from the notes which we were collecting that there's some confusion as to what are we actually trying to teach. I mean, like I feel like maybe people are not aware of what we're actually talking about. You know, I mean, it's it's not necessarily about the programming. It is about this, all of this. You know, you need to know how to operate this. You need to know how to query it. You know, and uh, yeah. These are great resources. Yeah, these. I mean, my selfish version of it is for the few people I had saying, when are we going to get to the HPC stuff in my traditional software carpentry workshop in January would be, well, when we have lessons for it. I mean, the shell lesson to me is prerequisite to being, to being the HPC lesson. And then, as I said already, um, so, I mean, it would, it, for me, it would be, they're not even, they're not even programming. They're mm -hmm. at best, they're making a conda environment or bioinformatics, or they're going to run molecular dynamics, or they've got a Fortran code that they need to do a Monte Carlo in or CFD work. And there's a commercial applicant, whatever it is. 90% of my load right now on my cluster is molecular dynamics probably. Oh yeah. Uh, definitely. Well, maybe not quite that bad, but it's, 70 probably um and the remainder of it is is cfd you know mm -hmm. there's some machine learning but it doesn't crank up a lot of hours because it's all gpu based and with the exception of the few people in computer science that are doing machine learning versus the computer engineers that are doing machine learning they're not programmers for the most part we have a lot of electrical engineers using the machine learning libraries and some of mm -hmm. them just spin up a nice little um, Jupyter lab on the compute node. And then I'm like, why have yep. you done this? You know, like, I have, I, I let my people do it as long. I mean, they got to reserve the resources, but a job is a job, especially if I ever start charging. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's and that's actually nice that you mentioned all this um, in detail because I think that's that's one of the challenges. We have such a mix mixture of people, um, and there are other centers that will come around and say, "No, we have hardcore MPI programmers um, that need X and Y." Um, you name it. Um, cool. Um, I would actually conclude this session now um, yeah. because I'm simply that tired. Um, and uh, I would, uh, because it was mentioned on the chat already, um, um, so what are the next steps? Um, so basically, the, today was more li really like a show um, to give people a chance to, to have a look into the uh, details. And then in September, we will put out a call um, when we start working um, uh, with a task force and want to establish it. So just monitor the coordination repo mostly and um, put uh, click that watch button um, so that you get notified on automatically and then you should be good to go. Oh yeah, one last request. Could you, like, because this is recorded, you'll have the chat transcript. Could you paste all of these? Oh, I see Mike has pasted his uh, uh, link, but like you could probably put all these links in the chat. Where you... No, that's not me. That was Trevor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Different purple. Oh, did I paste? Oh. oh, yeah, that was it. Maybe after the lesson, you could just copy out all the links from the chat.txt, which will get saved, and then just put them here. Oh, that's cool. I just, uh, yeah, I just, I save just the, chat. the entire. Okay, cool. I just did also. So, um, <laughs> yes, we will have the content. We will have the, yes. <laughs> We're all paranoid about <laughs> video yeah, conferencing exactly. chats disappearing. So, yeah. we are okay. learning our 2020 lessons. Um, so, yeah, let me just reiterate. Uh, so, if you if you are nervous about uh, contributing to HBC intro and using Git, um, I'm happy to uh, do a, a pair programming type session with you. Um, just uh, let me know and we can schedule something. Um, thanks for, for tuning in. Turn it back over to Peter. Thank you. Bye.